listening to SOJC Radio, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and teaching the doctrine of Christ to the whole world. Good evening and welcome to Friday night FOJC Remnant Gathering. Grab your Bible and your pens and your paper, and when two or three are gathered in his name, the Lord is right here with us. So thank you for joining us, and here's Brother David. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the April 21st, 2023 edition of the FOJC Remnant Gathering. I am David Carey Cohen. For the next hour, we will be studying the Word of God. So thankful for all of you that are joining us. Our study for this evening is entitled, The Talking Book. So glad to have you all on board. As always, things are popping here at FOJC. So much going on. And there will be an event for the Feast of Pentecost here at the Puritan Barn. More details could be coming tomorrow night on the Midnight Ride. But uh, it is a go, and the details will be released uh, very soon. So be in prayer about that, that that will just be an awesome event, as I'm sure that it will be. This Sunday night, 8 p.m. Central, the Redneck History Channel will be live on FOJC Rumble Channel. On our Rumble Channel, FOJC Rumble. And our special guest, Joe Caruso, will be back with us for the broadcast this Sunday night, 8 p.m. Central. FOJC Rumble. Paul and his family, they want prayer to find fellowship. Tricia needs healing from abuse. Ada and her husband they have a death in the family and financial hardships there are brothers and sisters in Australia Adam needs deliverance from addictions and Melissa is wanting to strengthen her healing and she's also praying for a Christian husband we want to come and I'm going to say that there is a special I'm going to put it an unspoken request, and we thank all of you. We live on prayers here at FOJC, and uh, there's a special unspoken request that I have in regards to the ministry, and uh, I'm just going to leave it at that for the moment. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so thankful once again to be able to come before you and lift up our request to a all-powerful and loving God. And Father, we just lift up this event on the great feast of Pentecost that we are attempting to host here at the Puritan Barn, Father, that you'll just orchestrate it to be a tremendous blessing and a tremendous benefit to your kingdom. Father, we want to pray for Paul and his family to find fellowship and for Tricia to just turn to Jesus for the healing that she needs for the abuse that she's suffered. For Ada and her husband, our brothers and sisters in Australia, we just pray, Father, you comfort them during this death in the family. And we just pray, Father, that you just pour out your financial blessings upon them. And, Father, we just do pray that you just open the storehouses of blessing upon the Israel of God. As times get tough, we know, Father, that your resources are unlimited. And we just pray for that blessing upon the Israel of God and upon Ada and her husband. We want to pray for Adam for deliverance from addictions and it is there for him in the name of Jesus. We want to pray for Melissa that you'll just find the proper partner for her and that you just give her spiritual strength and healing. Father, we want to pray for this broadcast tonight. We just pray, Father, that you'll just pour out your Holy Spirit upon it, and that you will just use it to the uplifting of the edification of the body and for the furtherment of the kingdom of God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we agree. Amen and amen. Worship the Lord for just a few moments, and we will be back with our study for this evening, The Talking... We're sorry, but because of copyright rules... You cannot hear my music. 
However, if you want to hear the message in its entirety with my music, you can join us on the radio page on Friday night for the live audio broadcast at 6 p.m. Central Time, or you can listen on our podcast page at fojcradio.com. Here's Brother David. Turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 6, and we're going to begin reading in the 20th verse. My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart, and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou wakest, it shall talk with thee. Amen. The talking book. Uh, do you believe the book can talk with you? And I, I know that to be a fact, and I know many of you do also. And we're going to be examining the supernatural character of the Word of God. And we know that it's supernatural because it puts us into contact with that spiritual realm where the Lord dwells, but it's even more than that. It is really alive. The book is alive. And Charles Bridges, in his commentary on the book of Proverbs, said of this text, Take care that nothing hinders your early converse with this faithful counselor before the world comes in as the best means of keeping the world out. Happy is the mind to which the word is an undivided companion. There has been a general shift in opinion among professed Christians. Most today don't even believe that we have um, an inspired infallible word of God. They're thinking in the realm of which translation is closest to the truth and uh, this type of mentality and the very notion that we have an inerrant Word of God is something that is just gone uh, for the most part. Very few people believe that anymore, and that's one of the main reasons why there's such a mess out there amongst the people that profess to be the 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 people of God. In First Peter chapter one and verse twenty three, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Turn to your neighbor and say, the book is alive. The book is alive. The word's alive. And it it couldn't talk to you if the word wasn't alive. The word is alive. And the things that the word of God says about the word of God are truly amazing. The word of God will speak with us and it will it will be our constant companion and we should have an awareness of this we should have a love for the word of god that just knows no bounds we should have a respect for it and in the text in the book of proverbs it's talking about the law of moses it's talking about the law of moses and one of the responses we did a teaching with tracy it just aired last night on her he walks with us everywhere channel on the sabbath one of the comments you people are under the law you know well everybody is under the law in that sense because the law is still valid you cannot do away with the ten commandments with uh with a wave of your hand or with your favorite theology book god set down his ten commandments for all eternity and he set down the sabbath for a perpetual covenant that's the way that it is and if you don't like that you're just on the wrong side of the issue there is no negotiation on that point the lord is very clear in psalm 119 and verse 97 there is something that we should all be able to loudly proclaim oh how i love thy law it is my meditation all the day do we have this attitude i mean do we love it do you desire to meditate in it to draw closer to god to adapt your life to a more and more pleasing conformity to that blessed word 
of God and his law. And we're going to be talking about the full extent of the law. In the text in Proverbs chapter 6, it's talking about primarily the Torah. And we're going to look at the full scope and the understanding of what God's law fully is throughout Scripture. And Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, The law of God should be so dear to us that it should be bound about the most vital organ of our being, braided about our heart, That which a man carries in his hand he may forget and lose. That which he wears upon his person may be torn from him. But that which is bound about his heart will remain there as long as life remains. We are to love the word of God with all our heart and mind and soul and strength. With the full force of our nature we are to embrace it. All our warmest affections are to be bound up with it. Oh, how I love thy law, O God. If we cannot say this, if we cannot say from the deepest part of our heart with the fullest sincerity that we love the law of God, there is something tremendously wrong with your relationship with him, if indeed you have a relationship with him at all. The absolute horror of someone that has the vain audacity that they can just do away with the word of God and his law with the smart, snippet remark, that person is indeed in grave danger of hell fire. The attitude that will put you in a relationship where the book will talk to you. And a lot of people, they don't even want the book to talk to them. They want to do their own thing. But let me tell you what, the book will talk to you if you respect it and and we're going to we're going to of course unpack those things that we must do but the bible says the word's alive that the word of god lives forever that it will talk to you when you wake up that it will be your companion we should understand that supernatural element and love it with all of our heart. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. The Bible talks a lot about people in the last days that are going to be offended, that are going to fall astray. If you love the law of God, you will not be offended. Oh, how I love thy law, O Lord. Oh, how I love thy law. It is something that there's not words to express it. You will not be offended. And whether or not you love the law of the Lord, literally, it not only depends on whether you're going to stand or fall, but it depends on whether you've even walked out onto the playing field. In the very first psalm, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Oh, how I love thy law, O Lord. In verse 3, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. What a promise. If we love the law of God, we can get a hold of the prayer bells of heaven. We can set ourselves to work for the kingdom. We can pray and we can hear the answer from the halls of the third heaven. Amen. Whatever we do will prosper for the kingdom of God. It will bring forth fruit because the law of God is our meditation. Now, the text in the book of Proverbs says, When thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. And obvious one of the biggest problems is the reason why the Bible isn't talking to a lot of people They're just asleep, aren't they? It's amazing the absolute spiritual dullness of the majority of professed believers in Christ. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 11, the text says here, 
Romans 13, 11, and that knowing the time, and do you know the time? Do you know that we are living in a time where the judgment of God could absolutely ravish our nation even before this broadcast is completed? Do you know what time it is? If if someone can look at what, and it's just daily, just the things that came out this week concerning AI and what's going on with that, if you can look at these things and not be tremendously concerned you're just not a rational human being and i think so many people they adapt the stay dumb say safe attitude they can't process us they don't have no paradigm to understand it they're not being giving anything from these assemblies they're a- attending to enable them to walk through this minefield but we need to know what time it is and we need to tell people it's time to wake up and knowing that the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed it is time to wake up in Ephesians chapter 5 the 5th chapter of the book of Ephesians in the 14th verse Wherefore he saith, Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. And in this text from the book of Ephesians, the person that is asleep is dead. They're dead. They're totally asleep. And when you're asleep, it's just very much like being dead because you have no way to communicate with the outside world. And people need to wake up. They need to wake up to Jesus Christ. And when they wake up to Jesus Christ, they are going to wake up to the truth of God that is going to show them how they need to conduct themselves in each and every situation in life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 34, this tells us what we have to awake to to enable the word and the book to speak to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the verse 34 awake to righteousness and sin not for some have not this knowledge of God I speak this to your shame how true is that this evening awake to righteousness and sin not for some have not this the knowledge of God and this is it the people that are making a mockery of sin the people in these apostate bordellos that will not preach against sin they don't have the knowledge of God because if they did they would know that the Lord is a holy God too holy even to look upon sin and he is too holy to look down on those apostate messes and do anything but write Ichabod across the door awake to righteousness and sin not this is what will happen when you awake to the word of God And when the word of the Lord begins to speak to you like that friend that is closer than a brother, what you will awake to is righteousness and you will awake to the fear of God. In the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it also tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And if you don't have the fear of God, you don't, you, you don't know nothing as far as God's concerned, and you're incapable of doing anything as far as God's concerned. If you have not awakened to righteousness to where you are at war with sin, you have no fear of God within you. And let's just get a little biblical definition of the fear of God. And what kind of a fear of God could anyone have that just flippantly says that the Ten Commandments are not binding upon them? There could be no greater expression of someone that has absolutely no fear of God. There is no higher expression of the denigration of God and His law. And you cannot separate God from his law. Let's get a biblical definition of the fear of God. In Exodus chapter 20, this is a is a lesson that they did not forget. Exodus chapter 20, and let's begin in verse 18. 
And all the people saw the thunderings and lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. When God gave his law, his blessed, holy, unending law upon the mountain, the mountain shook. The mountain shook, it quaked, it was smoking with fire, and I guarantee you the people backed up. They were afraid, they had the fear of God, and in verse 19, and they said unto Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. They were afraid that their little selves were going to die. They didn't know a whole lot, but they knew God was holy, they were sinful, and they were coming in the place of something that was going to kill them in the situation they were in. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you that ye may fear, that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. If they didn't sin, they didn't have any reason to be afraid. But if they wanted to profis- pro- persist in sinning, and denigrating God's law, let me tell you, you better be afraid. You better be very, very, very afraid because the fire of God will one day break forth upon you and it will burn you to a cinder. It is not negotiable to say that the law of God is inconsequential. We need to say, oh, how I love thy law, Lord. When we can come to where the law of God is our meditation, it's in your head, you know. You get an earworm sometimes. You know, we know what an earworm is, don't we? That little silly song or jingle we hear and we can't get out of our head. Well, we need some Torah earworms. We need to have the Word of God meditating and go over in our mind constantly that we can more and more conform ourselves to that great moral precepts that God has laid down for us. And there's a fundamental loss in understanding. There's a general disbelief uh, in even the Bible being true and inspired, and even less that people really believe that when they hold the Word of God in their hands, they're holding a talking book. The Word's alive. The Word will talk to you. And if you will conform yourself to the fear of God, you can expect to be hearing something from the book. First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the Word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. What sayest thou this evening? As I preach the word of God to you, am I just preaching the word of men that's filled with errors and contradiction? Or am I preaching unto you the inerrant, infallible word of the Lord that will work within you very effectually? If you receive it, not as a word from man, but as a word from God, this will work in you, and it will work in you very effectually. The book will talk to you. In Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, Wherefore, I will not be negligent, to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Richard Baxter said that the great art of successful teaching was repetition. He believed in continually teaching on the fundamentals of the faith to um, to just constantly remind people of the things of salvation. And I guess that's the Puritan in me, and that's the Holy Ghost in me that wants to constantly put people in remembrance of those foundational truths that they need to know so much. And I'm I'm really concerned. I'm really concerned with so many people that they're prideful. 
I don't know of, of a nicer way to put it, but they're prideful. And they think they know so much more than they really know, and they don't feel the need to really study and learn to a tremendously thorough degree the fundamentals of the faith. And that, my friend, is the reason why we have such a mess that we have. That's why over and over I will teach the fundamentals of the faith. I will bring in doctrine into every message I teach, and I will bring in uh, on the doctrine of Christ and enduring sound doctrine. We must understand those truths of God. That are so important. And I will continue to remind people and remind people. This is the words of Albert Barnes on this text. He says, It was of importance for Peter, as it is for ministers of the gospel now, to bring known truths to remembrance. Men are liable to forget them, and they do not exert the influence over them which they ought. It is the office of the ministry not only to impart to a people truths which they did not know before, but a large part of their work is to bring to recollection well-known truths and to seek that they may exert the proper influences on the life amidst the cares, the business, the amusements, and the temptations of the world. Even true Christians are prone to forget them. We must not have a haughty attitude that we know it all. And I guarantee you, I'm seeing way too much of this. We need to have the attitude that I can't know it good enough. I need more and more the Word of God. Tell me again. I tell you, for when it comes to a deep, deep, profound subject, there is nothing more important and nothing more deep and profound than the gospel of salvation. I mean, we're talking about something that I can proclaim to people and it will absolutely change your life. It will it will send you from the road to hell to the road to heaven. It will supernaturally change you at a germline genetic level. They're doing everything today to destroy your genetics. Well, the Lord will change your genetics the minute you believe. There's nothing more supernatural than that, to take the drunkard and sober him up, to take the, the gossip and to tame that tongue. And of all the things, and I, I will teach on everything, because the Word of God will open all things up to us, but let us never forget those fundamental truths that we need to hold close to our heart. I will always put us in remembrance of those things, because when we lose sight of those things, through a haughty arrogance, that we know it all, and we don't need to hear it, pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Do you know this evening... And I, and I love to preach on the, um, the deep things of God. You know that I do. I love to sp- preach on the spiritual world. But do you know at this very moment, in the halls of heaven and of those angels that are upon the earth, do you know what fascinates them the most? What fascinates them the most is the gospel that changes people's hearts and lives. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us, did they minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. That's what fascinates the angels, that men and women can undergo a supernatural change by their faith in God because we're preaching a message from a book that is alive. Praise God, the book is alive, and it will speak to you. In the 17th chapter of Acts, there are different attitudes that are reflected upon people's opinions of the Word of God. And these are opinions that are still very much with us. In Acts, the 17th chapter, let's look at verses 10 and 11. And the brethren immediately, 
sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were no, more noble than those of Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. We need to be Bereans. We need to take the word and and check it. I mean, that's why we put the scriptures. Sister Donna's going to put the scriptures up there. It's going to be there. You look at it. You read it. You study it. This is what we need to do. You need to script, search the scriptures whether those things were so. But we also have to have the fear of God that we're in submission not only to God, but we're in submission to his word. You cannot separate God from his word. But today, there is such a disrespect of God's word and a disrespect and a general unbelief in Christ that Jesus can say that he came to gather first the tares and you've got an apostate church that's going to say the wheat are going to be gathered first. We've got a clear definition of the biblical Sabbath in Matthew 28 and 1, and yet people will say, well, I want to do that Friday night rabbinic Sabbath. I just don't know. I can't know. That is more than just a wrong doctoral opinion. That is a denigration and a disbelief in the Word of God. Because the minute you respected what Jesus said in Matthew 13, your pre-trib rapture would be gone. The minute you believe what, G what is recorded in the Gospels in Matthew 28 and 1, that Friday night rabbinic Sabbath would be in the trash can, and you'd be following the Word of God because the Bible would be speaking to you. The book will talk to you, but the book won't be able to get anything through your head if you do not submit yourself to the Word of God. When the Bible says something to you, don't argue. Said, Amen. Let's go for it. Now, let's think about the law of God. In the law of God, in our text, in Proverbs chapter 6, it's referring to the Torah, referring to the Torah. Now, is anything else now but the Torah the law of God? And the answer is, yes, indeed it is. And we could very well say that everything in Scripture, you know, we call ourselves whole Bible believers here. Everything from Genesis to Revelation is God's law because every scriptural precept is something that we must conform ourselves to the whole Word of God and if we will allow the Word of God to speak to us it will Charles Spurgeon said this he says that God's law by which I understand the whole run of scriptures and especially the gospel of Jesus Christ will be a guide to us now let's think about that and what brother Spurgeon said is absolutely spot on. The law in the text in Proverbs referred primarily to the Torah. Now in 1 John chapter 2, the scripture says this, and this is a good one for all of those that think they can, you know, today there's this amazing phenomena. There are people that claim to follow Jesus Christ without following Jesus Christ. I can follow Jesus Christ, but what he taught ain't for me. All right, well, the bus for hell is going to be leaving for you very soon. There is no such thing as a disciple of Christ that is not sitting at his feet and doing like he said in Matthew chapter 11, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. We must respect all of the word of God. And if you diminish and denigrate, whether it be the Ten Commandments or whether it be the doctrine of Christ, let me just be clear. Get ready for hell. The bus for hell will be leaving shortly, and you're going to be on it. In 1 John chapter 2 and 4, and this just isn't my opinion. This is the clear teaching of the word of God in 1 John chapter 2 and 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Liars abound. There are many more liars that are picking up 
the book, and usually it isn't even the right Bible, the King James Bible, but they're spreading lies. They're using apostate Bible translations to say that not only the Ten Commandments, but the doctrine of Christ is null and void. And let's be clear, let's be very, very clear. In Second John, and let's look at verse 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. We will not go along to get along in saying the Ten Commandments have passed away. We will not go along to get along to say that you can be a Christian and denigrate and turn the things that Christ said inside out. You need to get the fear of God in your life and you need to let the book start talking to you to stop following men and follow the eternal, holy, everlasting, omnipotent God before you wind up on that bus to hell because it surely is going to be crowded. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, nothing could be clearer than what Jesus said in the Great Commission in the 28th chapter of Matthew and the 20th verse, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's the only doctrine of the church, to teach people those things that Christ commanded. And in 1 John 2 and 4, it says, if you do not obey the commandments of God and the law of God, you're a liar. And just like Brother Spurgeon said, you, you can't say, well, and this is the popular thing. Well, you know, Jesus, uh, he taught something new. The law is done away. The Ten Commandments are gone. That's such a lie. That's nothing but a lie. It's a damnable lie out of the mouth of Satan. And we must rebuke them. And we must put out that clarion call of repentance and coming back to Jesus. That's what Jesus wants. He wants people to come home to him. Now, Brother Spurgeon made, and he says so many things that you can get some Spurgeon earworms going, I guarantee you. And he made us another statement. Uh, And he preached a sermon, uh, the talking book, which is what gave me my idea to explore this topic this evening. And he made a statement. He said, error is dead. Truth is alive. There are so many people that are really hungry for spiritual truth. They want to know answers, and they're going into apostate churches, and they're being fed poison. They're being fed poison. They're being fed lies. And it's like the starving uh, children that their bellies are bloated up. And, and they're sick because they're ingesting poison. There's only one thing that will feed our souls. And that's the pure word of God. That living word of God which will speak to us if we approach it with the reverential fear of the word of God. In Acts chapter 20 beginning in verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. I want to feed the church of God with the blessed doctrine of justification, sanctification, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, freedom from sin, the life of holiness, the truth and the blessedness of God's law, and walking in a truly blessed life where we are established in the truth of God. People, the so-called ministries of God today, they're producing starving cripples. They're not producing people that are strong, that are going to be able to go through the fire because they are not rooted and grounded in the faith. And they are ingesting poison, and poison will not nourish your soul. In First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, the admonition of the apostle, excuse me, First Peter 5 and 2, feed the flock of God. We 
as ministers of the gospel, we have a responsibility to feed the people that take the time to listen to us. They need to be fed the precious truths of God's word. They need to be reminded constantly that the Bible's real. It can be trusted. It's inerrant. It's infallible. Trust the word of God and not man. Trust Jesus Christ. We need to feed the people. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. That means this is not a profession. This is a calling. And this is where so many people go astray that they will not teach those things that are uncomfortable. They will not say those things that will not tickle the ears and tickle the flesh of those that would come in and pad their ministry with finance and money. We must feed the flock of God. And it's so profound. Everything that Jesus said was so profound and so true. And in the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus was having a little conversation with one of his apostles. And let's, let's just tune in and let's read that. John chapter 21 and verse 17. Okay, 15. Thanks, Sister Donna. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto them, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved, because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. The only shepherd that can truly feed the sheep is one that truly loves Jesus. You see, if I really love Jesus, I will feed you with Jesus. If I really love Jesus, I'll feed you with the pure word of God, even if it goes against the grain of our flesh. But if I love myself, and like the admonition in 1 Peter 5 and 2, when the apostle said, feed the flock of God, he said, not for filthy lucre. You see, because by compromising the word of God, you can make carnal advances in the flesh but I do not want any and I'm looking and we're having tremendous blessings on FOJC but it will not be through compromise with this carnal demonic spirit of the age whether it be going along with transgenderism or going along with AI we will not be going along we love you we love you enough to give you Jesus. And unless you really love people, you're going to compromise. And this is why Jesus three times said, Peter, do you really love me? If you really love me, then you feed the sheep. And there's only one thing that's going to bless your heart and bless your soul. And that is the pure doctrine of Christ. Not only, and I, over and over, we say the cross, the doctrine, the example of Christ, it's the, his doctrine and every word he said that we teach everything that he commanded, which validates all of the Old Testament moral law. We teach the doctrine and we teach the cross because on the cross of Christ, every spiritual benefit was made available to the Israel of God through faith in, his, in the cross and through his example, there are many things that we can only learn from Jesus by reading the Gospels and seeing the example that he set down. If you love Jesus, then feed the sheep with Jesus. In the Gospel of John, chapter 6, and verse 35, Jesus saith unto them, I am the bread of life. 
He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. This is the only food for the Israel of God, the true, pure doctrine of Jesus Christ, and the pure, true doctrine of the Word of God, because the Word of God will talk to you. Amen. And we're gonna we're just getting warmed up here. We got a lot more to say about the Word of God, how it's alive, how it's gonna speak to you. I just can't get enough of it. So we're gonna take a break and we're gonna be back in just a moment on the FOJC Remnant Gathering. This is Tracy Vanet from He Walks With Us Everywhere over on YouTube. Knowing the doctrine of Christ is the most important thing in your life, whether you know it or not, as David Carrico says. We are excited to bring you the sound doctrine we need to endure these last days. Our newest original series, Enduring Sound Doctrine, is now airing on my YouTube channel. In Matthew 24, 13, Jesus says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I like to say it's not a hop, skip, and jump to the end. It's an enduring. We welcome you to come over to He Walks With Us, one word, everywhere, and subscribe, like, and share. And please remember to subscribe, like, and share FOJC Radio's YouTube channel, Underground, one word, church. Thank you for listening to the content that we're presenting, and of course, for your support and your love and your prayers. We hope to see you over there. Hello, FOJC Radio Remnant family. Sister Donna here. I just want to thank all of you for your support and your love and kindness. Just wanted to let you know that here at FOJC Radio, we want to reach the world for Jesus. I know you know this verse. You've said it as a child probably many times. But as a reminder, in John 3, verse 16, 17, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In order to do this, we have chosen to use many different avenues. We have our regular Friday night message with Brother David, and then we have our Sunday night live, and we have different people on it. And we even have the Redneck History Channel. And if any of you haven't heard those two guys, you need to go and listen. And then we have other Sunday Night Live programs with David and Tracy. Sometimes we're on Rumble and sometimes we're on YouTube. You just never know who we might have on there. But I just wanted to remind you all and Thank you for your support and give us a listen on Sunday Night Live. These programs usually start at 8 p.m. Central Time. You never know what we might be doing. We're full of all kinds of surprises. We want to reach the world for Jesus.
coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall bring my life to worlds unknown. I shall bring with him on high. Jesus, 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 name I know. Now back to tonight's message with Brother David Carrico on FOJC Radio. Welcome back to the FOJC Remnant Gathering. And as I always do at the break, I want to sincerely thank each and every one of you that prays for us and that studies with us and that supports us with your gifts and with your kindness. We do appreciate it so very, very much much we couldn't do what we do without you we're going to get back into the word of god just another reminder uh sunday night 8 p.m central uh on fojc radio rumble channel just go to our home page fojcradio.com hit our rumble link and you'll be there uh tomorrow night at 8 p.m another episode of the redneck history channel joe caruso will be back had a tremendous broadcast last time with Joe and we're looking forward to another one we'll be dealing with the topic of flat earth another one of my favorite topics and um, we have just finished a uh, seven lesson series on flat earth that I Tracy and I recorded and it will begin airing on her he walks with us everywhere channel very soon and I'm really excited uh, there's just going to be a lot of really neat things in that I know you all are going to enjoy very very important topic one of my favorites we're going to be all over it this Sunday night 8 p.m. Central FOJC YouTube channel and just a big thanks to I'm just so thankful that the Lord has uh, sent uh, Brett and Tracy and Brian and many others that are just doing so much to really put the message forward. We're so thankful to be able to be yoked here with Now You See TV and all of you that are praying for How can we lose? You know, you don't lose with the stuff we use. There's just no doubt about it. So I'm excited. I am more excited than I ever have been in my Christian life. I am more expectant of what the Lord's going to do. The Lord has given me more faith to pray right now, I think, than I have ever had. And it was over 50 years ago. It, Man, that doesn't even sound right. But it was over 50 years ago in the Indiana State Prison where the Lord saved my soul. And he spoke to my heart in words that I can still hear to this day, the tremendous truth. God wrote a book. God wrote a book and ever since I realized that God wrote a book over 50 years later I can't go a day uh, I don't try to get me to have a day without my Bible and I, I tell you what I'm more excited and that's because the book is talking to me the book is talking to me and the book will talk to you it's a supernatural uh, friend and we're going to be talking more about that this concept about the book being alive just just say it again look at your neighbor and say the book is alive amen the book is alive because it is and this is what charles spurgeon said brother spurgeon said this commenting on the text we began with in the sixth chapter of the book of proverbs we perceive here that the word is living how else could it be said, it shall talk with thee. A dead book cannot talk, nor can a dumb book speak. It is clearly a living book, then and a speaking book. The word is alive. God wrote a book. It's alive and it will speak to you. Oh, how we need to know that. Oh, how we need to be reminded of that. Till that is such a part of us that it's our daily companion. Now, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, we're going to continue 
to deepen our concepts and understanding of the book being alive and how intertwined it is with Jesus. You know, Jesus was called the Word of God, wasn't he? And we're going to understand that there is no separating Jesus from the Word of God. He is the Word of God, absol- you know, by the way. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, this is not only true of this blessed book that I hold in my hand, my King James Bible, but it's also true of Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God. Jesus is the Word, this book is the Word, and you cannot separate the living Christ from the living Word, which is the living uh, book of God. Now, in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, there is such a intimate association in between Jesus and the Father, who is the Word. It says, Who being the brightness of His glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And when that says the expressed image of his person, what that word in the Greek means is you would take a stamp and stick it in an ink blotter, and then make an impression on a piece of paper. What the impression is to the stamp, that's the relationship of how identical that Jesus and the Father are. And we're going to look in the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 1, and it speaks of Jesus as the Word, that Greek word being the Lagos. In the beginning was the Word, capital W-O-R-D. And the capital W-O-R-D was God. Jesus is God. And the the Word was with God the Father, and the Word was God. So Jesus is God. And the word Logos, it means not just an audible word. Right now, I am speaking words that you can hear. Logos means the thought in my mind that I have before I speak the word. Jesus is the express image of the Father. He is the very thought in the Father's mind. He is the word made flesh. In John chapter 1 and verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You cannot separate Jesus Christ from the word because he is the word. The word of God is living and alive. The book is alive and Jesus Christ is living and alive, and he is the very word of God made flesh. Let's look at this in the lexicon. I'm going to look here, read a little for you from Danker's lexicon, and let's just look at that word logos a little bit. And it means the personified word of God. Literally, the word of God made into a person. And that's what Jesus is. He is literally the personified word of God. It goes on to say, It is the distinctive teaching of the fourth gospel that this divine word took on human form in a historical person that is in Jesus. Wow. I mean, when we get a hold of this, man, it's going to melt your wires. The word became a human being. The very thought in the Father's mind when he said, let there be light, this very word become flesh and loved us enough to die upon the cross for us. It goes on to say, there is one God who has revealed himself through Jesus Christ, his son, who is his word proceeding from silence. Praise God. And Jesus is the word. He's alive. And as as the the book mentioned in John chapter 1 and verse 8, it says this, John chapter 1 and verse 18, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath 
declared him. Jesus came to show us what God is like. Jesus is the ultimate manifestation of God. He is the very word of God in human form. You can't get any more clear or any more authoritative than that. And in John chapter 14 and verse 10, and woe be unto all of those that will try, and you know, we read the text in Hebrews 1 and 3 where it says Jesus is the express image of the Father. He said in the Gospel of John, I and my Father are one, not one person, but one in that holy essence. And in John chapter 14 and verse 10, Jesus said, Believest thou that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. The very words that Jesus spoke that we have recorded in our Bibles, they are the very words that the Father told him to speak. Woe be unto those that will try to make some distinction between the Father and the Son, that will try to erect some kind of straw man theological argument to say that everything left of Matthew is null and void and of no consequence. Woe be unto you, Woe be unto you is all I can say. In Revelation, or, well, let's see, let's go to 1 John. Let's go to the epistle of 1 John. And this is so good. That which was from the beginning, and this is referencing back to the gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the capital W-O-R-D of life. John the Apostle here is speaking from personal experience. He knew Jesus in the, in the flesh. He heard the Word made flesh teach from those holy lips. He saw the Word made flesh with his eyes. He handled him. Jesus and John walked together on dusty roads, and Jesus, he knew what it meant for Jesus to put his arm around him. What a testimony. Now let's just go forward in our thinking. John is speaking from intimate, first-hand knowledge of the Word made flesh, and in verse 2, for the life was manifested, and we've seen it, and bear witness and shew unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. The message of Christianity was not something that they made up or not, well, we'll follow this guy, that guy. The things that the Apostle John saw firsthand from Jesus, the things he heard come out of his mouth of his own ears, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, because the Word was made flesh, and the Word, the living Word made flesh, cannot be separated from that living word that we read. They are inseparable. And woe be to anybody that tries to rend asunder what God has joined together. Every time someone takes a clear teaching of Scripture, and whenever you take a Scripture in the Word of God and you contradict it, you are in trouble. We need to have the fear of God. We need to awake to righteousness and sin not. We need to once again have the book speak to us. But for the books to speak to you, you, we have to divorce ourselves from false shepherds that are going to do nothing but give us bloated stomachs from the poison they're feeding people. It has to be a return to Jesus. If we love him, we must feed the sheep. We must feed the sheep. And we must feed them. <clears throat> with the pure truth of the Word of God. And when people get a good meal, they know it. When you get something that's going to bless your heart and lift up your soul, you don't have to have someone tell you. People know that it's the Word of God that will quicken you, that will give you life. Walking in obedience to His Word is what will establish you. Giving heed unto God's law is what will cause you never to be ashamed. In the 
into the book of Revelation in chapter 19, <coughs> beginning in verse 11, when it talks about the return of the Lord. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He ain't taking a vote now, folks. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. That's the blood of the wicked, by the way. The blood of all those that will denigrate him and his father and their holy law. He had a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the capital W-O-R-D of God. When Jesus returns on that white horse, taking vengeance upon his enemies, he'll have a vesture dipped in blood from all of those that will receive their just condemnation and slaughter for rejecting the pure, holy truth of Jesus Christ. The Father loved him so much that he sent his Son to die for us. All he says, believe in me. Believe in me. My goodness. That's a no-brainer, isn't it? Shouldn't we believe in Jesus and trust in him than all of these shepherds that are going to serve up poison and bloat people's bellies? That should be a no-brainer. But as we know, these false teachers are thriving. In Acts chapter 20, verse 32, I've told the story before how that I was at a conference and a rather large one. <laughs> they had a... It was time to ask questions on the little panel. I, I just can't stomach that stuff anymore. I just can't stomach it. I've had to give up the whole conference circuit. It just, quite frankly, makes me gag. But... They ask a question, and the lady was sincere, but she just totally didn't get it. She said, uh, what discipleship program do you recommend? And I said, there's only one discipleship program. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you'll be my disciples indeed. I says, the only discipleship program there is is the doctrine of Christ. She said, yes, but what discipleship program do you recommend? And she said, this program, that program, or whatever else was popular. And I said, no, man, there's only one. There's only one discipleship program, and that is the doctrine of Christ. And that, sadly, is how far we've come from understanding that to follow Jesus really means to follow Jesus. And in Acts chapter 20 and the 32nd verse, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Now, this means that I commit you to this. Paul was here leaving the church in Ephesus and he was giving them the farewell uh, admonition and warning and you know today someone might said now uh, I commend you to this church this church has good doctrine you follow this church or this guy that guy this guy that guy Paul said I commend you to God I commit you to God and to the word of his grace because the word will talk to you in the first John it says you don't need anyone to teach you and if everyone just gets this if everyone can just get that that word is very much capable of speaking to you and we must have it we must have that word of God speaking to us that we are in sure advice committing people unto God and to the word of his grace in the epistle of 1st Peter chapter 1 1 Peter chapter 1, and let's look at verses 10 and 11. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Oh boy, I'm going to have to get a drink. Excuse me, my voice is wanting to go south on me here. All right. Now, 
Verse 11 again of 1 Peter 1. Searching what manner or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which is in them did signify. Now note what it's saying here. This is talking about the inspiration of the Old Testament prophets. And it says the Old Testament prophets were inspired by the Spirit of Christ. How can we separate the prophetic writings from Jesus Christ when it was his spirit that inspired them and that's the teaching of the New Testament that the Old Testament prophets are inspired by the very spirit of Christ woe be unto anyone that tries to rip them asunder when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and of the glory that should follow in 2 Peter chapter 1 2 Peter chapter 1 Beginning in verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do what you, excuse me, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed, as a as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time here again it's talking about the old testament for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but holy men of god spake as they were moved by the holy ghost praise god oh how i love thy law O lord oh how i love isaiah jeremiah ezekiel oh how i love everything in there from Genesis 1-1 to the final verse in the book of Revelation in John chapter 16. And here's a big thing for us to understand. The Holy Ghost is the author of Scripture. He inspired and moved the holy men of old to write And he superintended their thoughts and their writings in such a way to preserve what they did from error. In John chapter 16, beginning in verse 7, we understand that the Spirit of God will use the book. Amen. The Spirit of God will bring, we've read the scripture many times, and let's just read it again in John chapter 14 and verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And in John chapter 16, beginning in verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart... I will send him unto you, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And he does that by speaking to you through the book. The book is alive, and if we'll all just wake up to righteousness and sin not to the fear of God, the book will speak to us. The book will speak to us. And if we love God's law and we meditate in it, um, we'll never be ashamed we're going to prosper. We can set our hands to the plow in the kingdom of God, and we can see the Lord do great things, not because we're great, because he is. In Second Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 15, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Now let's just think about this. There's another text that speaks about Timothy's grandmother, Lois, reading him the scriptures. Well, in this text... It talks about Timothy being taught the Holy Scriptures from a child. Now, just do the math. If you figure out when this was written and how old Timothy was, the books of the New Testament weren't even written when Timothy was a child. We're talking about the Old Testament against here, folks, that they are, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. You see, faith in Christ will give you wisdom from the Old Testament because, by the way, the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of Christ wrote those, didn't he? 
the same spirit that anointed Jesus Christ, that he was anointed there in Nazareth, and he said, the spirit of the Lord hath anointed me, praise God. You see, you cannot separate Jesus from the book, because they're both the word, and they are both alive. In verse 16 of 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Oh yeah? Well, you better hear this. Dispensationalist false teachers, the Old Testament is profitable for doctrine in light of the doctrine of Christ. Amen? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Jesus said that the scribes in the kingdom of heaven was like someone bringing out of their storehouse things old and new. If you're going to be a true teacher in the kingdom, you are going to not only teach the things that Jesus said and commanded, but you will illuminate the Old Testament and the Torah in the light of the doctrine of Christ. We believe in the whole Bible here at FOJC, and by doing so, we are on solid, sound ground. We are doing that which Spurgeon and Wesley and Baxter and the first century martyrs did. We believe all the Word of God, and we will not budge. We will not budge from saying the book is alive, it's supernatural, it's inerrant, it's inspired, and it will establish and speak to each and every one that will truly love and respect it. That word, and I don't even know if I finished the 16th verse, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Theopostanos, that means God breathed. God breathed those words out, praise God. And the Father didn't breathe out words in English. He breathed out words in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. He inspired it. In Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, he preserved it in the Hebrew Masoretic text and the Greek received text, and he preserved it in English in our King James Bible. Praise God, he didn't just breathe it out, but he preserved it. You see, what good would it do if the Father would have inspired men to write the Scriptures, if he would just allow lying dogs and thieves to destroy it and they've done their best I guarantee you they have done their very best to try to destroy the word of God and they are at it day and night um, just all they can do but I tell you what all of these little imps of hell they will never be able to destroy the word of God because not only did the Lord inspire his word, but he also preserved it. Let's look at Psalm chapter 12. Psalm chapter 12, and let's look at verse 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words. Amen. The book's alive, and the book is not alive with filth and trash. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of fire purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Not only did the Lord inspire his word, he preserved it. If he did not, we would not have the word of God that we have right now. He inspired it. He preserved it. And we need to proclaim loud and wide, the book is alive. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Praise God. Every word of God is pure. Every word. Praise God. He has preserved it. And we are certainly so blessed for it. couple more thoughts here. In Hebrews chapter 7, and verse 16, we read the text in First Peter. It says, the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 16, speaking of Christ, it says, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, 
but after the power of an endless life. Jesus is alive forevermore, and so is the Word of God. For all of the attacks and the denigrations that we have upon the Word of God, it stands strong tonight. For all that will believe tonight that glorious gospel, you can be changed forever and your way for heaven made sure. And Jesus made us this promise in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35. He said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Amen. (coughs) For all of the apostate translations that will chop and throw this verse out, I call them the sweet 16. There are 16 fundamental texts that are ripped out of the the NIV, the New American Standard, uh, English Standard Version, this um, Messianic, um, uh, the, I can't even think of the name of the most popular Messianic study Bible, Lucifer's Sweet 16. They all rip out these and more. How far they go ripping, it just depends on which apostate version you're reading. But let me tell you what, for all of that mess, Jesus said, my words will not pass away. We have them tonight. They will always be here for us to read and cherish. And for all that fear the Lord, that book will talk to us. And how much we need that book to talk to us every morning when we awake. So with that, I'm going to close our teaching for this evening. As always, with great thanks to each and every one of you that studies with us. Tomorrow night on the Midnight Ride, going to be a good one. We're we're going to be tracking, uh, and my mind is going to be very much running the same way. I guess it would. It's my mind. But we're going to be unveiling a series with Tracy and I on the children of Nimrod, tracing the uh, children of Nimrod from the dispersion of Babel. That's very much what's going to be going on tomorrow night on the Midnight Ride. John is going to be looking at um, the, well, and I'm not even going to say, but we're going to be tracing another red-hot trail that's going to show us so much, and this is going to kind of dovetail in the next two presentations I'm going to be giving on the ride. I'm really excited about it. And uh, tomorrow night also, uh, or excuse me, Sunday night, 8 p.m. Central, get rowdy on the rumble with the Redneck History Channel. So let's just close out in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for all of your blessings and for all of those that pray for us and study with us and support us. Father, we thank you so much. We are so very, very fortunate to have true believers whose hearts are yoked with us. Father, we love you and we thank you. And truly, Lord, you've given a big vision in our heart that you want to fulfill for your kingdom. And Father, just do it. You know, we're here. Just take us and use us and just bring forth many souls born into the kingdom. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and agree. Amen and amen. God bless you all, and we will see you next Friday night, 6 p.m. Central, on the FOJC Remnant Gathering. Thank you for listening and joining in fellowship with us here at FOJC Radio Remnant Gathering. You can contact us at FOJC, Post Office Box 671, Tell City, Indiana, 47586. Or you can email us at lastdayschurch at cs.com. Or you may call us at 812-836-2288. You can check out our website at www.fojcradio.com. Thanks and God bless.